I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for, uh, for coming this evening. Uh, let's, let's jump right in. The, so first thing, roll call, sorry. Trustee Geyer. Here. Trustee Sperling. Here. Trustee Bauman. Here. Trustee Youngerman. Here. Trustee Marisek. Here. Trustee Betzinger. And we do have a quorum this evening. Um, the fourth <coughs> item, public participation. The first item is a proclamation for National Safe Boating Week of May, May 20th through 26th of 2023. Uh, with us this evening, actually, let me go ahead and read this and then I'll uh, we'll move on from there. So the proclamation for National Safe Boating Week, May 20th through 26th, 2023, whereas National Safe Boating Week is observed uh, to bring attention to important life-saving tips for recreational boaters so that they can have a safer and more fun experience out of the water throughout the year. Whereas on average 650 people die each year in boating related accidents in the US, 75% of these fatalities are caused by drowning. And whereas the vast majority of these accidents are caused by human error or poor judgment and not by the boat equipment or environmental factors. And whereas a significant number of boaters who lost their lives by drowning each year would be alive today had they worn their life jackets. Now, therefore, as village president of the village of Montgomery, I hereby uh, support the goals of the safe boating campaign and proclaim May 20 through 26, 2023 as National Safe Boating Week uh, and the start of the year-round effort to promote safe boating. I urge all of those who boat to practice safe boating habits and wear a life jacket at all times while boating. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, with us this evening from the Illinois Department of Natural Resources is a Conservation Police Officer Jared uh, Galvin. Uh, thank you, Officer Galvin, for being here tonight and receiving this uh, proclamation and uh, supporting boater safety. So you want to come on down? All right, uh, the second item for public participation is a uh, proclamation for Public Works Week, uh, which is May 21st through the 27th of 2023. Um, today I received an email uh, from our village engineering consultant, uh, Engineering Enterprises, uh, announcing Public Works Week. I wanna read their note before the proclamation and invite our public works professionals that are here tonight uh, to come down for a photo. Uh, I honestly could not have said this any better uh, myself. So uh, thank you to the amazing Public Works employees for their outstanding devotion and unfaltering efforts to ensure communities continue to run in an orderly manner. Uh, though most often overlooked, their actions are vital for our daily lives. From preserving the state of our roads and our water system to safeguarding us during uh, challenging times, these individuals are the foundation of our society. Our sincere appreciation goes out to all of the Public Works employees for their exemplary leadership teamwork and drive. And again, we express our gratitude for all that you do. And this is signed by EEI, uh, perfectly said. I'll read the proclamation and then we'll come down for a photo. Uh, whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities and services that are vital, in, uh, that are of vital importance to sustainable, sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, high quality of life and well-being of the people of the village of Montgomery. And whereas these infrastructure facilities and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of our public works professionals who are engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private <coughs> sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential to our citizens. 
whereas it is in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and all children in the village of Montgomery to gain knowledge of and to maintain ongoing interest and understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs in their respective communities. And whereas the year 2023 marks the 63rd annual Public Works Week, sponsored by the American Public Works Association. Now therefore, as Village President of the Village of Montgomery, I do hereby designate the week of May 21st through the 27th of 2023 as National Public Works Week, and I urge all citizens to join representatives of the American Public Works Association and government agencies in activities, events, and ceremonies designated to pay tribute to our public works professionals, engineers, managers, and employees, and to recognize the substantial contribution they make to protecting our national health, safety, and quality of life. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Ayes have it. Why don't you guys come on down? Um, let's do this in order. So the next item for um, public participation today, <coughs> item C, is a public hearing for the Douglas Road SSA number 45. Uh, I will open the public hearing. Is there anybody here this evening that wanted to comment on that public hearing for the Douglas Road SSA that we've been talking about? Okay, does staff or anybody from the board have any public comments on this? We've talked about it a couple of times. Okay. All right, hearing none, I'll close that public hearing and move on. Uh, item D is the public hearing for the Hammond Annexation Agreement. Uh, and this is separate from the TIF number four public hearing, but I suspect many of you are here this evening uh, to talk about the Hammond Annexation Agreement. If, if you do have comments, I want to hear them. Um, but I do ask that you be concise with your comments if you can. Somebody's made the same comment that you were gonna make. Um, we won't be offended if you tell us that you strongly agree with them, uh, ditto this and this and this point uh, that they made. Uh, keep it civil. Uh, we do have a microphone available. Um, please state your name and your address uh, for a public record. And we are asking that you keep, um, try and keep your comments to two minutes, which is our, which are our policy for hearing, for public comments. With that, uh, I don't think we have a sign-up sheet going around, did we? So I'll open the public hearing for the Hammond Annexation Agreement, and who would like to make public comment? I'd come down, and, and if, if anybody else wants to make comment, if you can maybe form a line on the stairs. Good evening. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Uh, my name is Kevin Swanquist. I own a property at 2615 Sunnyside Drive in Aurora. And I received the certified letter from the attorneys, so my home is directly impacted with the uh, zoning changes. And I just want to go on record to object to the rezoning of the Hammond property. I have concerns with the potential for additional flooding to the neighborhood traffic concerns with traffic increased going through the subdivision in and out. I have concerns with the contamination of potential with well water 
with the uh, construction work to the north of the properties. Also with noise, pollution, dust. These are all concerns with our subdivision as you'll find out with our other uh, people here. And uh, the mining and blasting I think is close to the subdivision. I have concerns with that as well. And also the effect on property values in the subdivision. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. All right. That's okay. I was gonna say, don't wait too long. We'll, we'll, we'll close it and move on, thinking that nobody came to speak. at 1680 Blackberry Road. I have many of the concerns uh, um, that he had mentioned and many of our neighbors have those same concerns. Um, as we discussed at the last meeting that parcel of land, number eight specifically, um, a lot of our neighbors and a lot of people don't even understand why we're trying to think of, why you guys are trying to think of zoning that as non-residential basically rather than residential. Um, we're also worried about and we're being told uh, by people that our properties would definitely flood because of the mining and, and everything the, that would be happening over there and it would disrupt a lot of the tile and everything like that. I personally don't understand all of it, but yeah, I understand my house flooding and, and everything like that. So I know a lot of my neighbors are concerned about the very same things and there's been nothing said at the meeting that could prove that it wouldn't happen. So thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Hi, my name is Brandon Galbraith. My address is 1650 Lindale Road. Um, I don't have much to add besides what my neighbors have added. Um, since the last meeting that was held on this topic, I have retained an attorney. If this special use permit is granted and this rezoning is granted, uh, I intend to litigate this with my attorney. Thank you. Uh, Grant Grinke, uh, 1655 Lindale. I agree pretty much with everything that was said. Um, they didn't talk too much about the traffic if the road goes through on uh, Creekview to Griffith, and I don't agree with that at all, bringing a lot of extra traffic through it. And uh, last time they talked full fulfillment center, and that would mean a lot of trucks in and out day and night. Don't want it. Thanks, Grant. Hello, my name is Andre Strelkoff. I'm at 9S 945 Lindale Road. I'm not gonna rehash. I'm sure we're all gonna really say the same thing. Uh, one of the things I wanna talk about is if we're gonna force a secondary entrance, as many of us don't want it, maybe put up some signs that say local traffic only, or if it's just for emergency access, get it off and put a Knox box there just to prevent additional traffic. We do have a lot of people that just walk, especially at night, with dogs, kids on bikes, and I mean, just asking for it if you're gonna give it as a way to get around, because that's an awful intersection. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Tom DeSort. I live at 2591 Sunnyside. And yes, like everybody else, I've, uh, walk, I walk the neighborhood at night and we all have deep concerns about you know, our well waters and we definitely don't want city water. Uh, my house has flooded pretty bad in the past and you, know, you guys are very familiar probably with the 96 flood. Uh, I couldn't live in my house for five months and Nobody helped. I mean, it, not like I was looking for help, but I'm probably living in one of the most flood prone areas in that area, and building a road on Orchid would create a bottleneck, and having all those, you know, surface streets in the back will just make the flooding 10 times worse. 
And yes, I'm also against the traffic, the property values going down, the mining and the blasting, and you know, the through road. It doesn't sound good. I wish you guys would put one in your front yard first before you try it in ours. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is uh, Doug Musser, Highway Commissioner, Sugar Grove Township Road District. I live in a village, 105 Grove Street. Uh, some of my concerns are what their concerns are, but I can't do anything about the annexation. I am a road district, and I'm talking about Creekside Drive, the annexation of that. Now, I don't know if you know the improvements of Route 30, the four lane. Are they gonna put a barrier up there? See, I don't know much about what's going on here. And anybody guarantee me they just gotta take a right turn out of Creek View? I mean, there's only one way in and out. And I don't want truck traffic in Creek View. I don't want any excess traffic, them roads or subdivision overlays. Mm -hmm. So they won't handle it. Uh, do you know anything about the Route 30 improvements? right turn only, or is there gonna be a boulevard, a light, anything of that, guarantee me anything of that? We, we can, we'll comment on that. We'll kind of okay. address everything at the end of the public hearing, is that all right? But yes, um, it's in process, but who knows when that funding is hmm. gonna happen. What is the reason of coming up to the end of that T there for a, is it a relief valve for traffic? If you're having traffic going from Orchard to 30, what, what, what's the purpose of that road coming up Connecting to? Connecting into Creekview? Yeah, coming up to Creekview. We'll address it. We'll get into all of it. Okay, just, okay. Yeah. That's, that's my concerns. Okay. I'm going to try and work with you. I mean, if they are going to put the barriers up and this and that, maybe we can, I don't want to annex the road in Montgomery, but if you can put a gate up, mm -hmm. something like that, you know, until yeah. all the construction and all that's done, if they're going to stop them from going left or right, that's an option. We'll, we'll talk about some options. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Sarah Root. Um, I live off of 1909 Stephen Drive, um, Blackberry Heights. As you know, there was that tragic motorcycle accident just not even a week ago, and that's my biggest concern with anything like this. Are we going to be promised an either an access road or a stoplight? I mean, that accident could have been prevented with just a stoplight. And um, with all this, I mean, other than everything that they said, our neighborhood has been neglected for so long between the fences from having, how many lanes is there now? Five lanes. We don't have any barriers from the traffic off of Orchard. Last week with that tragic accident, Nicholson Elementary School had to park their buses by behind Orchard Stop. We had to walk to the bus stop and then walk all of the elementary school kids next to that awful scene. I mean, there was, I don't even want to go into it, but having to explain that to kindergartners, having old women having to go get their grandkids from Orchard Stop walking. I mean, we have no protection over there, and I just don't want to be forgotten about. Thank you. And, and your, your address again? I missed it because I was writing something down. 1909 Stephen Drive. Stephen Drive, so is that east, uh, east, You're east on of the east Orchard side Road? of Orchard Road? I'm right next to Orchard Stop uh, gas okay. station. I have no idea, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Brendan Moran, Sugar Grove Fire Protection District Fire Chief, 25 South Municipal Drive, Sugar Grove. Um, I was asked to come to the meeting tonight to address the connection between Creekview and Griffin. As a purely on the Fire Protection District side, having a secondary access to your neighborhood is huge for us because as you know, the narrow streets. Um, having the ability to get in if there was a major incident at the front of the entrance or even deeper in where you guys couldn't get in 
Um, they may not have been affected by the incident itself, but then having the access in for a secondary call. Um, so that's purely our end of things. We support the connection to Griffin. I do agree with the gentleman um, about signage and things like that to keep trucks out of there, um, especially, you know, well, like I said, it's narrow roadways. I totally understand what you guys are talking about as far as the um, uh, semi-traffic through there. Nobody wants that, so I don't think you guys do either, so. Um, the rest of my comment is all financial based and really leads into the TIF, but part of the annexation would be involving all that. So I'll have more when we go to the TIF board. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. All right. Any other public comment? Go ahead. And so staff is taking notes. I think it would make sense after the, at the close of this public comment to have staff um, provide some comments to these or have the petitioner provide some comments um, just so you get some answers. Hi, time to sort again. I'm also worried about the, uh, that forested floodplain that's you know, between Jericho Road and, and 30, you know, leaving that a, you know, a floodplain the way it is you know, helps the water and the flooding, you know, adding fill to that area and building that up would be devastating to, of course, my house. Uh, when my house flooded back in 96, you know, it was a, hopefully just a once in a lifetime flood. But uh, I had nine feet of water in my seven foot basement. I really, I could not live in it for five months. And there has been many times where water has almost been up again to my window wells, you know, almost covering the road, you know, my driveway in the front of the house. It's bad. And having all that roofing in the area and not, you know, making provisions for, you know, uh, uh, flood water. I've, I've seen the, the little, uh, water retention pond on Orchard Road on the west side of it, you know, and it's on a hill. <laughs> that thing has never had water in it. That's the dumbest idea I've ever seen. Putting one in a high spot, you know, they need to have flood protection where it's needed, not on kind of the highest point on Orchard Road. If you look at it, it's ridiculous, but, uh, yeah, flooding is a big concern, and preserving that forested area, you know, I'm a huge outdoor guy, and ruining all that area for the, you know, the wildlife won't be good for anybody either. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Grandma Medlin. I live at 1771 Barkberry Road. It's the second house on the left. So if you cut off um, Barkberry Road to 30 and we can only go right, that's gonna make us have to go into the neighborhood more to get out. And my only concern is also is the safety of our neighborhood because it's been a very outstanding neighborhood and very safe and very quiet. And I'm also concerned right now about the mining company that they're gonna put in because I feel like that of the health reason. Um, and I also heard that it, it, it could go through anyway because we could get a, per, Aurora could get a permit to do it and it could be because it's incorporated. And I would hate to see that gut come in because of the health reason of our neighborhood. And I just wanna keep our neighborhood safe. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Steve Jendrusik. I live at 1702 Blackberry Road. And in the last meeting, Montgomery was the one that wanted the extension of Creekview Road. <clears throat> and I personally think that I would hate to see that used to influence how we are gonna be able to get out on 30 when it's expanded because it's easy enough for their saying that 
you've got an exit, we're gonna make you go right every time you leave. So by Montgomery requesting that extension, I would like to think that wouldn't have a bearing on that, but I don't trust the way things are going. Thank you. My name is Sandy Acuff and I live at 1661 Lindale. I'd like to go back to the zoning. When you come into, um, come down Orchard Road, not many people go through Montgomery anymore. And that's really the face of Montgomery. And as you're zoning all this area, a gravel pit is not a good look for Montgomery. Um, it just kind of, doesn't make it look like a very nice place to live. Um, so I really am strongly against um, the gravel pit for not just that reason, but I don't want blasting in my near, you know, near my home. Um, and as far as going down Orchard Road, I mean uh, 30, as you go down 30, you have residential pretty much everywhere except for the police station, and then you have a beautiful park, and then you want to put in some warehouses or whatever, that makes no sense to me that you want to make that commercial there too. Um, it, you know, you have that beautiful Jericho Park and you're gonna put in these warehouses. I would like you to think better. I would like you to think better for Montgomery. Um, I'd like you to think better for the, the people in the community um, and the people driving down the road looking at the community. Don't just put in something. Think about what you're putting in at what it looks like and so that the, it looks like an inviting place. You have some condos there that right now they look nice, but you start throwing in um, you know, just anything and it's not gonna look all that nice. So just think about what's being put in so that the community still looks like an inviting place. Montgomery's been a very nice town to live in. I've lived in Aurora my, all my life. I went to East Aurora. Make Montgomery look nice. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shannon Rogers. I live at 9S 945 Lindale Road. Um, and I would just like to ask the question on parcel eight, I believe. Why is there a 10 year delay to put the um, like retirement or um, the assisted living? And, but there's like an immediate kind of push to allow the special usage. I know in the last meeting um, it was, I don't remember the correct term that everybody used, but they voted against allowing a fulfillment center there. Um, I'm not sure if that means it's cut out completely. Um, I hope it is, but you know, if you're gonna put something there, I think we'd be okay with some type of assisted living or something like that instead of a warehouse um, or anything like that. And that's pretty much it, thanks. Thanks, Shannon. Good evening. Uh, my name is Joseph Marshall. I live at 1690 Blackberry Road. Um, I moved in about a year and a half ago, I think, um, and one of the attractions of that neighborhood was just how um, kind of isolated it is there. Um, it's very family friendly. There's children walking around all the time in the streets. Um, it's quiet, fairly quiet there. So I think uh, this development is gonna change uh, the nature of that neighborhood quite a bit. And so I'd like to lend my support to the objections of my neighbors. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? You know what? I'm going to cut you off at two. How about that? 
Two, two public comments I think was sufficient. Thank you. All right. Anything else on the public hearing? Anybody else have a comment? I'm not supposed to let anybody go twice, but a third time. Do you, um, I just want to ask you one question. You know what? Here, so. That's fine. We have a microphone we can get to you, just so everybody can hear. I, have a loud voice. I, have a teacher I know, but there's people online. Fine. Thank you. I'd like to know um, if we are going to get a certified letter to every one of our homes before the next meeting. Because we got nothing and we were told we were getting certified letters. What we'll comment on that? Okay. All right. If there's no other public comments, um, if if possible, should we handle responses to these now or do that later on during the meeting? How would you like to do that, Sonia? I think we can handle responses when we get to the annexation okay. agreement ordinance. All right, perfect. Because we'll okay. discuss some of their comments and have answers to it as we go through the perfect. PZC recommendation. Okay. And full disclosure, I think those are some of the comments that some of the board also had that the plan commission shared. Um, shared your concerns. So we're, we're, we're all asking similar questions um, and we do have responses to, to plenty of those today. Um, I should say that I have no plans uh, and I don't believe, I don't want to speak for anybody else here to in any way annex uh, your, your neighborhood, bring you into Montgomery, s supply you with public drinking water. Like it, I, I get that you don't want that. It's not a goal of mine in any way. I just figured I need to say that so you've heard it. Okay. Um, We'll move on, so close the public hearing. So we'll close the public hearing on the Hammond Annexation Agreement. I move on to the item E, which is the public hearing for TIF number four. Sonia. Uh, yes, so we have Mike Hoffman here from Tesca and Associates, which is our consultant um, that can kind of walk us through the redevelopment plan and what next steps are, um, and then we can open it up to the public. Perfect. Perfect, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mike Hoffman with Tesco Associates. Uh, I've got an office in uh, Plainfield, Illinois. Uh, we are here to talk about the Blackberry Creek uh, TIF district or TIF number four as it's listed on the agenda. Um, this is about 252 acres. It's essentially between Orchard Road and the Stewart uh, Sports Complex north of Route 30. Uh, Blackberry Creek runs right through the middle of it, as you can see from this illustration, and that's kind of one of the drivers for eligibility of this TIF district. Um, this kind of shows you the parcels. There are a total of uh, five parcels out there, uh, most of which are owned by one individual, as I understand it. Uh, the village does own that one little parcel at the far kind of southwest corner of the, uh, the map there. Um, to create a redevelopment plan for TIF district, there are certain elements that state statute requires us to do. Uh, they're listed here, uh, essentially to uh, define the boundaries of the area, which is that map that I showed you a second ago, uh, develop specific goals and objectives. In this case, it's uh, to promote economic development for the community and uh, specifically to, to address some of the blighting conditions, which uh, predominantly right now are flooding, as you've heard from some of the, uh, the residents for different reasons uh, tonight, but flooding is certainly a predominant issue uh, in this area and something that can be helped to, to be addressed by the TIF district. Um, uh, the, the reasons for establishing the TIF district are outlined in the redevelopment plan. Uh, there's a proposed budget and timeline in there. Uh, there's a section that talks about conformance to the comprehensive plan. Uh, this TIF plan is consistent with your comprehensive plan. Uh, there's outlined revisions on how you would go about revising this plan. TIF districts are typically created for 23 years uh, initially as this was proposed to be. Um, so there may be something that you need to amend in the future. This document outlines how that amendment process could work. Uh, this document also outlines impact on other taxing districts. 
uh, there's a statement of but for in here and which essentially says uh, if there isn't a TIF district put in place here and some mechanism to partner with the private sector, development probably would not be happening in this area. So uh, that's a key element to uh, designate an area for a tax income and financing district. Uh, the document contains all of those elements. Um, in terms of eligibility requirements, uh, there is really kind of one key criteria that was used for this area. Uh, the state, sta uh, state, state statute uh, has specific requirements for developed areas and undeveloped areas or vacant land. Uh, these are the criteria that you see on the screen for vacant land. Uh, and essentially you have to meet one of these criteria. And we clearly meet uh, item C there, which talks about chronic flooding. Uh, that has been well documented. Your engineering consultant, EEI, had done a very extensive study of this area, looking at flooding impacts and uh, the need for some improvements out in this area. Uh, that criteria uh, is met clearly by the documentation that your engineer has provided. So uh, chronic flooding is the primary eligibility requirement uh, that is met by, for this TIF district. This is just a map showing you the floodplain and showing you how extensive it is out in this area. The striped area is the floodway, which is obviously the most intense. Uh, and then the blue and the, and the brown areas are also flood, uh, flood way, uh, floodplain areas outside of the key floodway. So um, as people have talked about earlier that tonight, uh, flooding is uh, a critical issue out here. Uh, as I mentioned, this has been studied uh, previously by your engineer and documented well to to, to outline the, the prevalence of flooding out here and some of the ways that uh, the flooding issues could be addressed. Uh, this map is out of your comprehensive plan. The one on the left just shows that this has kind of been identified as a key growth area for the community. Uh, the map on the right is some of the specific uh, plan proposals out in this area, primarily focused on industrial and commercial uses. Um, and um, that is one of the goals of this plan is to promote those types of mixed use economic development opportunities for the community. Uh, this is just some additional exhibits from the comprehensive plan. Uh, the one thing that is uh, outlined in the comprehensive plan shown in brown there is some potential multifamily. As I understand it, that would be, if it happens, uh, be uh, age restricted. Um, so in summary, you know, chronic flooding is the criteria that is used to qualify this area for TIF. Uh, we did have a joint review board uh, meeting on April 21st um, that reviewed this plan and uh, really kind of the objective of the joint review board is to make sure that the plan meets all the criteria in state statute. Uh, the JRB did recommend approval and did feel that it met the redevelopment plan requirements in state statute uh, for, a, uh, for a blighted area uh, based upon that flooding criteria. Um, the village will not be acting uh, in, an, in any final manner tonight on this TIF district, you have to wait at least 14 days uh, after this public hearing, or after you close the public hearing, uh, to act on it. So there will be some additional time after this uh, hearing to um, for the for the board to, to make their decision. But um, that is a quick summary of the TIF and uh, what is being proposed. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks, Mike. Uh, anybody have any questions for Mike? Okay. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. All right, if I didn't say, state so already, I'll open the public hearing for TIF number two. Can't remember if I did that or not. And if anybody's four. here, four. TIF number four, we're not opening any public hearing on TIF number two. Sorry, TIF number four. Uh, is there anybody from the public that wants to make comment on this, on the TIF? I know the fire chief mentioned a comment. Anybody? So this is where it comes to the TIF district portion of my statement. Um, as always, we're always happy to see improvement and, and development within any of our fire district at all. The property in question, um, the joint review board I was at, I was the only no vote, by the way, um, it generates $11,000 a year in tax revenue for all taxing bodies. Our portion of that is $846.13. So to put it in a TIF district for 20 years, is gonna generate $16,000 to the fire district. In that 20 years, the $16,000 only covers a third of one cardiac monitor. So that's not even close to what we need, we're gonna to need to be able to buy. The cost of an ambulance has increased by $100,000 in the last year. The cost of a fire engine has increased by $200,000 in just the last year. So over the course of the next 10 to 20 years, it's gonna be exponential. 
and staying at $846.13 is unacceptable. 85% of our revenue comes from uh, property taxes, so that's a, a very large chunk of that. Um, with the proposed plan, with having parcel eight potentially being a senior development where it's restricted living, or restricted age restrictive living, um, that would increase our call volume exponentially. We have three of these types of buildings in our fire district now, and in the last two years, so from January 2020 to December 2022, we ran 316 calls for service in just those three buildings. The, in the same time frame, Foxmoor and Fairfield neighborhoods have generated 401 calls. So that's gonna essentially double our call volume in this area of the, of the village of Montgomery. And with that kind of uh, low tax revenue from the place that's gonna generate the most increase in calls is detrimental to us. We do a very good job of planning for the future and planning, um, forecasting our, our finances to be able to save if I know that in 10 years we're gonna have a age restrictive development, then I'm already planning today, and I was actually planning a year ago, to put something down here. If we have a double, uh, essentially a doubling of our call volume down here, it's gonna require us to have a station. It's gonna have, it require us to have an additional equipment, which back to the ambulance and engine increases. Uh, higher increased staffing, which is always an ongoing cost. Um, and $846.13 isn't going to cover that. Okay. So I respectfully ask that you do not pass this TIF district. If you do pass it, then there needs to be something else in this annexation agreement that would help us financially as far as impact fees for commercial and residential development. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. Oh, one last comment. Yeah. Thank you. All right, unless there are other public comment on TIF 4, I'll close that public hearing. Okay, I'll close the public hearing and move on to the last item for public comment and then we'll, we'll jump right into this, back into this stuff in a minute. Um, public comment, two minute opportunity. Is there anybody here tonight that did not speak uh, for either of those that wants to speak on anything else? This is the required public comment period that we have at every meeting. Uh, but I don't suspect we have anybody. Okay. Yeah, I, I do oh, perfect. Come on down. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kyle Householder, uh, Blackberry Crossing West. I'm actually here um, for Blackberry Crossing West uh, Homeowners Association, the director um, on that association. Uh, more or less inquiring with you guys, um, Mike Klupar had sent uh, Haley, our community manager, an email regarding the detention areas. Um, so more or less inquiring what's kind of going on with that. I don't know if any of you know what's going on with that. Um, I don't know if you can comment on that at this point, um, but more or less inquiring on that um, because you guys have been maintaining the mowing of those areas and now we're being told, which of course we haven't done it since the subdivision has been there. Uh, so we don't have the funds for that either, which of course we've already done our budgeting for the year. Um, so just looking for a little comment on that. And then um, I've also heard that uh, the village may be uh, open to just taking ownership of those properties and, and because you guys are doing the maintenance or were doing the maintenance of them anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you can comment on that at all, but, um, or if there's a I can, point that we can. Yeah, staff can connect with you. Can anybody just, um, Maybe bounce outside when he's ready to leave and mention, just talk to him real quick. Get his That'd contact information. Yeah, if you want to give me your cool. information, I'll yeah, follow absolutely. up with you. Perfect. Okay. Would you, I'm sorry, would you repeat your name again? You said it really fast. I'm sorry, Kyle Householder. Thank you. Oh, I almost called you John, Kyle. Ah, sorry about that. Yeah, that's fine. All right, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. What's your number? Uh, 630. 
Uh, Mark Fitch, Sr., 1732 Maryland Drive. I thought this would be a nice area to raise a family. I've got three kids. Fire chief over there okay. saved my son's life twice. He has Down syndrome. Okay. I came to ask for some help over there with everything that's going on with ordinance violations and everything like that. I've worked in factories for 20 years. I'll tell you what, this is disgusting. I'll leave these here for you. You want to build a place where we're going to bomb, and I've got kids right down the street. I'll move. My dad worked in a stone quarry for 30 years. He almost died three times. They get 800 bucks a year. That's a joke. I come here, this is pettiness compared to what they're going through. You can keep them. All right, we don't have anybody else for public comment. <clears throat> Dan, you want to grab that door? Thank you. Okay. Move on to the consent agenda. I'll read uh, the items, and then uh, Trustee Sperling has a, an edit to one of them. Uh, a is the minutes of the May 8th Village Board meeting, uh, executive session minutes for May 8th. The accounts payable through May 2022, the refuse support for April of 23, uh, reappointing W. Buchanan to the HBC, and reappointment of Jean Lee to the HBC. Go ahead. So on the uh, item B, the executive session minutes, uh, regarding our first item, uh, we went in to discuss some litigation. I, I would just be much more comfortable with it noted that I recused myself and left the room during that discussion. Thank you. Okay, and we pass it with that edit. Second most, or second with uh, Teresa's comments. That's allowable, right? Okay, and you second uh, any discussion? Go ahead and call the roll. I never made the motion though. I just, I just said my, oh, yeah, I Bauman, motioned that sorry, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, Trustee Bauman? Yes. Trustee Youngerman? Yes. Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Geyer? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. That carries 5-0, thank you. <clears throat> All right, items for separate action tonight. I would like to go out of order and take uh, two, what I think will be much quicker comments and get those um, out of the way. Uh, the first item is K, uh, review of and act on bids for the Ogden Hill water storage tank. Uh, Mark? Mark's friend, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, we're um, asking for consideration to reject the bids. Um, we didn't feel they were competitive, and uh, we'd like to uh, work on a, another um, option for uh, doing that work. So, okay. Second. All right. Any motion on that? I just got one. Good Second. Can I ask a question? Yes, you can. Okay. When was the last time we cleaned this tower? Was it like three years ago, or? 2017. 2017. Wow, time wow. flies. Is you know, it seems like this tower gets dirtier than all the other towers, and I'm wondering if the coating isn't failing on the tower. Should we just be looking at recoding, or so it's scheduled in 25 uh, for a repainting of the tank. 20. Oh, I'm sorry. In 2027, uh, it will be set for uh, repainting of the tower. Okay. I'm just wondering if we shouldn't try and pull that up if. It sounds like we have a coating failure out there that the clear coat's not doing what it should do. We can uh, inspect the exterior um, and just make sure there's no uh, problems with the coating failure. <coughs> so we'll okay. do that. All right. Thank you. If we go out for rebid on this item, um, would the work take place, place this year or would it take place next year? Uh, it just depends on um, how quickly we can get it out and whether or not we do any combining of other projects with it. And I guess my other, if it pushes to next year, does that push the painting a year? No, it doesn't. Okay. All right, any other discussion? Um, I think I did. He did, and second. second by Marisek. Why don't you go ahead and call the roll. Trustee Youngerman? Yes. Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Geyer? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Bauman? Yes. 
All right, that carries 5-0. All right, the last item there is L, review of and act on bids for the Montgomery Park improvements. Director Wolf. Thank you, President Brawley. So as the Village Board is aware, uh, we were looking to make improvements to Montgomery Park uh, in the downtown area. Uh, on May 12th, bids were uh, open for the project. Uh, the project consists of a stage element, uh, granite memorials uh, for the first responders and uh, Veterans Plaza, as well as uh, lighting and work to the WPA Plaza. Um, in opening that bid, there was only one bidder. Uh, bids came in substantially um, higher than what our estimates uh, were for the project. So at this time, staff is requesting that we uh, reject that bid, um, give us the ability to go back, uh, revise our uh, strategy moving forward for bidding, and then we would bid this at a later date. Um, this would postpone the project from being completed before this year's Montgomery Fest, uh, but give us enough time to regroup, uh, come up with a better strategy um, that we think will help us address some of the cost issues um, and give us enough timeline to be able to complete it before next year's festival. So if there's any questions, uh, I can answer those or also uh, Greg Sagan is here with Signature Designs uh, if anyone has any questions for him. Thanks. As I asked during intergovernmental, um, if we go out for bid again, as I understand, we're going to break this into smaller pieces. Uh, maybe, maybe we get better value there. Are we going to do that relatively quickly? And if we do, are we going to start construction this fall? Or are we going to start construction in the spring? What I don't want to do is I don't want to be sitting here a year from now and we're still not ready for Montgomery Fest. So we're going to be regrouping after tonight's meeting with uh, the results of the board, what you choose. Um, and then we'll be coming up with a strategy and a game plan for us to move forward. We do have both of those options. We feel with the timing that we have um, in the rest of this year to be able to complete either, um, whether that's construction this fall uh, and or pushing construction to the spring. But again, we're going to we're going to do a little bit more research. Um, it's been extremely difficult um, finding contractors to bid right now. Um, there is a, a large amount of projects out there. Um, and so, again, as Trustee Youngerman stated, trying to split those bids instead of one lump pack package that was put together for this RFP, um, splitting out some of that specialty work. Um, we also were dealing with some soil issues that um, we weren't apprised to until uh, the soil report came back. Uh, again, this has been a project that's been, you know, a passion of the village board and, and staff as well to get completed before this year's fest. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have that information um, at the appropriate time. Um, so once we got it, we had to make some adjustments, uh, which required some additional costs uh, with the RFP making those uh, amendments. So um, again, giving us a little bit of flexibility tonight and rejecting those bids, um, coming up with a better game plan. Now we already have items, already have items that we've approved for, for purchase, like the monuments themselves, and I believe the, um, shade, the, the shade, the sales, and so forth. How does this affect those productions or so, lead times? Great question, and sorry for not covering that. So we've already reached out to Peter Troost, uh, who's the spire of the granite memorials. They are willing to hold uh, the granite uh, pieces for six to 12 months. They'll be complete. Um, so that's a great benefit for us. Again, not um, Im impacting our timeline. Those, those projects will be uh, engraved and ready to go. They'll hold them in their yard for six to 12 months at no additional charge. As far as the shade sale components, um, those will be will will still have scheduled to be delivered. Uh, Public Works will take possession of those and will store those until the project's ready to go. Um, so we really shouldn't be impacted as well uh, with any of those delays. Again, those were our major items that we anticipated long lead times on. So in a sense, we're still in a great position as we've got those kind of out of the way and completed already. Okay. Motion to reject the bid. Second. Any further discussion? Go ahead, Debbie. Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Geyer? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Bauman? Yes. Trustee Youngerman? Yes. Okay. That carries 5 0. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. All right. Moving back to the top of the items for separate action. Uh, the first is Ordinance 2010, establishing SSA number 43 for Central States Bus at 30 line uh, baseline road. This is a waiver of first passage on the second reading. Unless staff has any, anything else to add, I entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I 
you said this is a dormant? Is this dormant or is this, okay. Uh, go ahead. Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Geyer? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Bauman? Yes. Trustee Ungerman? Yes. That carries five to zero, thank you. Item B is resolution 2023-014, authorizing stationary food vendor licenses in Montgomery. Director Epps. Um, thank you. Uh, Taco Grill and Salsa Bar is requesting approval of a new stationary food vendor license to locate at 1100 Ogden Avenue, which is the parking lot for JCPenney um, site. They have granted permission um, and <clears throat> provided an agreement to Taco Grill, uh, provided they're able to obtain a license to Village and follow all of our local requirements. Uh, they have their Kendall County Health Department license and provided their proof of insurance um, as they have in the past. Um, if this resolution is approved, um, then our list would increase to four and add Taco, Taco Grill back to the list. Okay, and this is just for this year, right? For this year, but then we renew it every year. Okay. It doesn't have to come back before the board for their, their annual renewals, but. Okay. This is not any sort of liquor component to this license, oh, no. correct? Okay. So they moved from Menards, mm -hmm. now they're in front of J.C. Penney, and they've been operating all this time without a permit. They've been there, what, a year? No. Were they there Not last quite, year? No. They, they uh, went away for a little while, and then they came back at J.C. Penney, and we told them they and needed the, to come the in. The spring of this year? It's taken a little time for them to yeah. follow through. Yeah, I'm not interested in issuing a permit. I, I look at this as a solicitor's permit. If you fail to come in and get your permit before you do business in the village, there's got to be a penalty for it. I mean, the guy's up there, I just drove by, was it today or yesterday, he's up there, now he's got a big canopy. He should be probably giving a request for a permit to build a house up there or something, or a, a shop. It, it, he's, he's permanent, he's, he's set up permanent, and he's done this without a permit. And I don't think we should give him a permit. I mean, you gotta come in and get your permit. That's, that's my opinion. Yeah, I, I wasn't very happy that he just decided, I'll just go over to that parking lot and set up shop until I figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> Has there been any um, conversation, concerns, comments from any of the other restaurants in the area, either existing or um, potential, or those that are currently building with the food trucks that are popping up in that area? I've not heard anything from any of them. I think Trustee Geyer brings up a good, good point. And it, it's actually, I'm, I'm now gonna switch to a no because I'm, one of the things I was gonna bring up during new and unfinished business is that we have all these solicitors that have come in and they, they've requested a permit. And I know that when they come in and they request a permit, they are told you cannot solicit until you have this permit, until you, we, you've been told that it's acceptable. So there were a couple solicitors in my neighborhood the other day that when they knock on my door, I give them my trustee card and say, you need to go to this address, blah, 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 blah. And uh, they say, no, well, we've already done that. And then, then it's a different conversation. It's, you've already been explained the rules, and by your own admission, you're already breaking those rules. So there need, you're right, there needs to be some sort of enforcement there where if you're going to do that, and you know the rules, and you're already breaking them before you even have your permit, we're just not gonna give you a permit. If you want to continue to solicit, it'll be a fine per house, and it's gonna get relatively expensive. So, uh, good point. Um, quick question to clarify. They moved from the Menards lot, and Menards vendor came in and got a permit, correct? Correct. So we've issued that permit. Yes. So I'm a no. They, they just moved next door. It's, they couldn't negotiate with Menards to redo their lease or whatever. They couldn't get a good enough deal, so I'm a no. So we need a motion to approve, and then we vote yes or no. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Okay. Any further comments? <clears throat> this is a motion to approve. So if you don't want it, I want to hear some no's. Oh, you will. <laughs> well, um, and this does have any other effect on the other licenses that are listed on the... No. Page two at all? Okay. Trustee Geyer? No. Trustee Sperling? No. Trustee Bauman? No. Trustee Ungerman? No. Trustee Marisek? No. Okay, 
that fails zero to five. Um, I think the message back to them would be that the board is definitely not interested at this time. Okay, um, so the next items are the items that uh, everybody came here to speak uh, about tonight. All of these items see through the end of the meeting, uh, which would be J or the end of this portion of the meeting. Um, with one exception, we are not voting on this evening. So we'll talk about these. Uh, these are all first reading, so there's no votes on those. We are voting at, is it scheduled on June 12th? It will happen, or we will have those on for a vote at that time. So we do have to make one procedural vote tonight, uh, but that's not anything binding. That's on Planning Commission recommendation. I'd like a motion to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation. Second. Sure. Uh, when we're yeah, when we're accepting the Planning Commission recommendation, we're essentially and you can add more on this. We're we're saying that we got their report. It is not saying we agree or disagree with it. Yeah, that's correct. The motion is just they procedurally have to make a recommendation to the village board. So the village board is accepting the fact that it exists. It is in no way saying that, that the board agrees or disagrees with our opinion. Okay. Um, motion. Second. There's been a motion and a second. Any discussion on the recommendation? Okay. Call the roll. Okay. Trustee Marisek. Yes. Trustee Geyer. Yes. Trustee Sperling. Yes. Trustee Bauman. Yes. Trustee Youngerman. Yes. That carries 5 0. Okay. Now we're into the meat and potatoes of this. Uh, staff, would you, do you have comments to make or do you want to invite the petitioner up first? Staff will take a crack at it first. Okay, go ahead. All right, I've got my screen shared and we'll try to work through this. Um, so as you know, the petitioners are requesting to annex and rezone the property um, that's located on the west side of Orchard Road, north of 30. Um, they're requesting to rezone the property um, more specifically for a future, future commercial and industrial. We have parcels, um, move forward to the next screen here, parcels one and two, uh, which are along Orchard Road. So in these areas here, to be zoned B2. Uh, parcel three, to be zoned M2. And that's this area up here in the darker purple. <coughs> Areas four, five, and six to be zoned M1, which is our light manufacturing district. That's here, here, and here. And then parcels seven and eight um, to be zoned B2, also our commercial district. So that's this area down here. Uh, they are also requesting flexible zoning um, for that parcel eight to allow the parcel to be rezoned to R5, which is our multi-unit dwelling district, um, after 10 years to allow for age-restricted and or assisted living. Um, they're also requesting four special uses as part of the planned unit development. This includes mining on parcel three. So again, that's that M2 area there up at the northeast corner. Um, for a concrete ready mix plant, also on parcel three in conjunction with the mining use. Um, they're also asking for a special use for outdoor storage for fulfillment center on either parcels four, five, or six. So that's these light purple areas here, um, or the northerly 17 acres of parcel eight, um, which would also, for parcel eight, would have a special use for a fulfillment center um, if located there uh, because it is zone B2. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. What is the acreage of parcel eight? It is, I believe, just under 27 acres. Okay, so it's like three, three mm -hmm. quarters of that lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, they are asking for a special use for a gas station with car wash on either parcels one or two. Um, <clears throat> additionally, as part of the PUD, they're asking for a few additional things um, that would include being able to excavate any materials on parcel five. That would be here on the opposite side of the creek from parcel three where the mining would be happening. If that area is to be excavated to provide for some regional detention for that area, they're asking if there's any gravel there that they'd be able to excavate it and move it onto their mining site. Um, they're also asking for grandfathering of the agricultural uses out there so that um, until areas are developed, they would be allowed to be continued um, to be used for agricultural uses. Additionally, they're asking for some flexibility um, with their final PUDs. So they're asking for some extra time as they don't have a developer in hand at this time um, to be coming in with final PUD plans um, with some additional timing, um, specifically asking two years rather than um, one year with the ability to ask for an additional one year extension. Um, 
Some of the things that have been brought up specifically have been about access and stormwater and floodplain. Um, with the access as part of this um, preliminary PUD plan and as part of the annexation agreement, um, in conjunction with what we've recommended as part of our transportation plan in our uh, 2035 comprehensive plan, all cut road be, would be extended through the site um, to the west. Additionally, Griffin Road would be extended through the site to the north to connect with Alcott Road. Um, this should um, provide additional access into there and also relieve some of the congestion at the Orchard Road Route 30 interchange and has been a part of our comprehensive plan for close to 10 years now. Um, additionally, we have um, a secondary access here proposed, um, as some of the neighbors have brought up. Trans our transportation plan calls for this connection to Griffin Road from the Creekview Manor subdivision for Creekview Drive um, to provide secondary access into um, that subdivision. So this would allow them, rather than having to exit and make an unprotected left-hand turn onto Route 30, this would allow additional access for them to get to Griffin Road, come to a signalized intersection to be able to turn out onto Route 30. If it connects to Alcott Road, that also provides them the opportunity <clears throat> to be able to go up to Alcott Road and turn northbound onto Orchard Road from that intersection rather than the Route 30 intersection. Um, so just uh, provides some safer solutions for them to be able to get to going um, eastbound or northbound on Orchard Road um, without having to make that unprotected turn um, out onto Route 30. Um, Additionally, addressing stormwater and floodplain, as you know, a large portion of the property is located in either floodway or floodplain, approximately 96 acres of that 252 acres. The floodway area is generally not developable, and any grading or work deemed appropriate uses in that floodway would have to be permitted through IDNR. Um, portions of the floodplain could be mitigated to allow for development in accordance with the Kane County Stormwater Ordinance, which includes providing uh, the appropriate and required compensatory storage for any fill in those areas. All stormwater improvements will be reviewed by our <coughs> village engineer for conformance with our stormwater ordinance. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission held the public hearing on May 4th. Um, several of the residents here were at that hearing and expressed um, several concerns or objections regarding the development. These included um, the mining uses and blasting, as we heard tonight, um, concerns about the impact that the mining would have on groundwater quality and their wells, uh, noise and dust from the mining activities, um, concern about a fulfillment center um, near the residences and the increased noise and truck traffic related to that use, increased truck traffic in the area in general due to the non-residential uses proposed, um, concerns about the extension and connection of Creekview to Griffin and cut through traffic through the subdivision, um, noting that there's safety concerns since they have no sidewalks or street lights in their subdivision. Uh, also uh, increased flooding in their subdivision and properties due to the development, concerns about proposed development that would eliminate the possibility of sound wall for their subdivision when Route 30 is expanded. Um, concerns that this would force their subdivision's annexation into the village and requirements to connect to city water and sanitary service. <coughs> requiring sound walls, they requested requiring sound walls along the perimeter of the residential subdivision to buffer them from adjacent residential uses. And they had questions about IDNR and EPA review and approvals um, of any development out there, um, including the mining. Um, the commission also discussed some of these issues. Um, specifically, they had concerns about dust and pollution related to the mining and ready mix use, concerns about a fulfillment center on parcel eight near these residences, um, and expressed their preference for senior housing rather than commercial or a fulfillment center on parcel eight. Um, we did respond to some of these concerns and we will hear um, in a moment again um, that were expressed by the public and the commissioners. But after some discussion, the Planning and Zoning Commission voted um, on the different items. They voted 6-0 to recommend approval of the annexation with conditions. They voted 3-3 to recommend approval of the rezoning with conditions. And they voted 6-0 to recommend approval of the special use for the plan unit development, including the gas station and outdoor storage. However, excluding the fulfillment center with outdoor storage on parcel eight and excluding the mining and concrete ready mix plant uses on parcel three um, with conditions. So that being said, <coughs> I'll kind of walk through some of the concerns um, that people expressed tonight and at the public hearing. Um, try to go through our list and uh, Engineer Wallers and I will try to um, address these uh, the best of our ability. I think uh, first off, We'll just um, address the certified mailing just so we can get that 
out of the way. Um, and Attorney Julian, if you can address that regarded the certified letter for the zoning versus what happens for the annexation agreement. Correct, yep. So the zoning entitlements that were discussed at the Planning and Zoning Commission are a separate process from the annexation agreement itself, which is what the public hearing was this evening, even though they're um, closely related. So with regard to the zoning matter, um, there has to be notice by certified mail to property owners that are within 250 feet of the property line. Um, and that list is compiled by the village and the petitioner, um, and that is what is actually issued by certified mail. In addition to the statutory requirements of the certified mailing, the village also imposes an additional requirement above what the state statute is, which requires the notice on the actual property um, on the major roadways. And then as far as the annexation agreement notice, that is only required by newspaper publication 15 to 30 days in advance of the hearing. That does not have a certified mailing requirement. Okay, um, moving on to traffic concerns. Um, again, we are talking about commercial and industrial uses. Um, in this, uh, primarily we are looking at Alcott Road and Griffin Road as being the main thoroughfares that commercial um, and industrial traffic would take getting into this development as development occurs, um, hence that connection. Again, we have Orchard Road, which is a Kendall County or not Kendall County, I apologize, up here, it's a Kane County um, road. So um, again, this is a road that is designed to handle higher volumes of traffic and can handle truck traffic and increased um, um, visitor traffic that's coming in to go to any of the commercial uses or the industrial uses that would be located on this property. Similar to Route 30, we have a state highway here that is designed to be able to accommodate this level of traffic um, and future um, Future designs will again accommodate the level of traffic that would um, be coming out of this type of use. As development happens and um, any sort of intersection improvements are done here at Alcott Road or if additional curb cuts are going to be required onto Orchard Road, traffic studies will need to be provided um, to Kane County for their review uh, to determine what is necessary, if this is adequate, if a full access, right in, right out, et cetera, is, is deemed necessary in these areas. Similarly, if there's any additional access that would be asked for off of Route 30 uh, for this development, it would have to go to IDOT for review and approval. Um, internally, um, given how Route 30 is um, and what kind of uses would be coming in here, we can certainly do something to say that there's no cut through traffic there, it's just local roads, no truck traffic, but um, the plan is not designed to be bringing truck traffic through the unincorporated subdivision off of Route 30. Uh, the design is for people to be going to Griffin Road to be able to come in if they're coming off of Route 30, to be accessing via Alcott Road if they're coming in off of Orchard. So um, that is uh, the intention and the design for this and is probably the path of least resistance. Um, truck traffic is not going to be going through, is not gonna be designed to be going through the residential subdivision in order to be access uh, any warehouse that would be off there, any commercial um, retail centers and things like that that might be happening in the area. Again, those roads are narrow. They're not meant to accommodate a truck traffic. Um, and a signalized intersection is certainly going to be easier for people to get out onto Route 30 um, and for them to come in onto Route 30. So again, I don't see cut through traffic being a major concern here, just with the direction of traffic and how they would be coming in, it's, or and how they would be exiting. They're not going to be making an unprotected left-hand turn through that subdivision to get out. Um, additionally, coming through there, that's a mistake a truck will make once if if they decide to go through there. Um, not to say that it is a concern, not to say we can't put in signage or work with the Highway Commission on putting signage on there to say that this is not a truck route and would allow for enforcement in that way. But um, I don't see that being a major concern logistically just on how the traffic movements happen and how one would access there. I also wanna note that there isn't a secondary connection happening on the other side of Creekview. It is just going west. I mean, the idea is that Creekview would be kind of cul-de-sac there on the east side, so there wouldn't be like an additional connection that would come up to Alcott Road um, that would provide that other access. It really is just that that west access to Griffin Road that it would be providing. Um, let's see. And this development in no way benefits from the connection to Creekview. 
the connection to creek fee that we're talking about is really for the benefit long term of the property in there and for f emergency services to get in there because um, who knows what they're going to do to route 30 which i know pete's going to comment on right so i guess we'll lead into then pete talking a little bit about route 30. yeah i guess one other uh, point of context um, we've always tried uh, in the development of properties in the village to have more than one access point to a subdivision either uh, with the initial design or future uh, you know design so uh, almost you know all the subdivisions have multiple access for reasons the fire chief stated so um, it is cul-de-sac to the to the uh, east so um, I think the likelihood of that being any kind of a significant cut through is, is diminished because of that so we think that it would be would not be uh, prudent planning to have not have a secondary access uh, especially given the conditions on 30 and, and the amount of traffic that's there um, with respect to um, route 30 we mentioned at the um, public hearing that a phase one had been uh, for the zoning and planning meeting that a phase one had been completed uh, i did have uh, uh, occasion to get to the uh, approved phase one to look at it and it does provide um, for full access at uh, Blackberry Road or Blackberry Drive um, Blackberry Road so that this is what they're talking about doing here the, so the state of Illinois when they publish their phase one they are proposing um, at the um, This location is a it's a full intersection, so it means you can go in, out, you know, left, right, all that. So that is in the approved phase one. So typically, the phase one then is the guide as they develop phase two plans. So uh, you know, absent something different happening, um, we would certainly expect that they would maintain that as a full access. And when you say phase one, that's IDOT commissioned a phase one study for the future planning of US Route 30. Right. They approved the phase one, and then you can kind of go into where they are, but also comment what the purple is, so in case anybody lives in a purple house. Yeah, so there were two questions that kind of related to phase, the IDOT, US 30, and phase one. One was, you know, the access. So as I say, right now they've proposed a full access, so that's consistent with the fire chief reported. The second question was, you know, are they going to put in a sound wall or not put in a sound wall? Excuse me. The, the decision for the sound wall is, is uh, IDOT, but it's based on voting from the neighborhood. And when the phase one took place, the neighborhood voted to put the phase, uh, put the sound wall in. So that is also included in the recommendations for the uh, US 30 when it gets widened. So that yellow line that you see there is the approximate location uh, of the sound wall where it's going in. So, so, you know, just wanted to confirm that. And that's nothing that the village has any control over. That is 100% controlled by uh, IDOT. Uh, they make the decision. And again, it's based on a federal policy that requires residents to vote. Your property has to qualify for a sound wall, which it does, but then you also have to vote to put it in. So right now, again, sound wall is in. Uh, village has really no input on that, and the full access will remain. So those two things are what is currently proposed with phase one. Now, when they get to construction is, is an unknown. We don't have a schedule. I think I mentioned it. The, uh, planning and zoning meeting that there it's not in the multi-year plan yet so um, it has to get into the multi-year plan obviously before it uh, can get scheduled but uh, they they plan out five years currently it's not in a five-year plan however they do review that every year so it could get added to the five-year plan so that's yeah. kind of where we're at with IDOT. We spend a lot of our um time lobbying for funding to have that because I know this concerns everybody I know a couple of us live in the subdivision down here many of you live up there US Route 30 is a constant headache for everybody um, with, with um, not even talking about the accidents that are that happen in the area 
we lobby for the funding for construction for this uh, consistently, probably for the last decade. Um, right now in their five-year plan is engineering for the final stage of this, um, which is a step in the right direction, but it's not funding the full improvements. So we will continue to push for that. Yeah, the other thing that we've been petitioning for is reduction in speed. Um, that hasn't been granted to us either, but uh, we'll continue to work on that. Uh, but as, you know, as time goes on and, and generally background traffic increases, staff concern is that it's just going to get harder and harder to make that left-hand turn out of the subdivision. So that's why we think having a secondary access to Griffin where you can make a safe turn, especially if it's an inexperienced driver, we just think that's a benefit. Um, I know we've got another subdivision on the east side that we're uh, concerned about right now, and, and uh, I guess we don't want that same situation to occur on, on the west side of the intersection. So that's, that's a report on the IDOT's current um, status on the intersection and then on the sound walls. Thanks, Pete. When we talk sound walls on 30, would we anticipate it being similar to the sound walls further east along Seasons Ridge and Boulder Hill? Probably. Same height, same. Well, the height may vary. I'd have to go back in the report to see what they, they um, designed the, the height of the wall. It looks like it's going to be nine feet. Thank you, Sonia. <laughs> so, um, but they vary is my point. So you may look at another location along the corridor and it may be a different height. But in this case, it'll be a nine foot wall. Okay. I don't, honestly, I don't remember what the height is of the existing panels uh, on 30. Uh, along, you know, the stretch between uh, Seasons Ridge and um, they're tall, and, tall and Douglas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're tall. so, but they, they, you know, they vary it based on the requirements to make sure that they can get the decimal reduction that they need to. Okay. All right, next up, um, we will talk a little bit about flooding. Um, again, as we've said, we have. Um, no, I'm sorry, not right now, but we can catch up with you after the meeting. So um, we do have two floodways um, on this property, one being the Montgomery Overflow floodway and the other being the Blackberry Creek floodway um, that go through this property. There's been expressed concerns about <clears throat> flooding impact of any development in this area and what it would have on the subdivision. Um, I think Pete can speak uh, specifically to um, the permitting process and what the requirements are regarding um, stormwater and impacts on, on flooding. Director Apt, I think, gave a pretty uh, thorough uh, overview of the, the flooding and the floodway and the, and the jurisdictions, but I want to add a little additional context to that. So this drawing shows um, the floodway, uh, the floodplain, and also shows some remnants of a field tile that was uh, part of the system. Um, I know one gentleman mentioned that there's a, you know, a detention basin at the, on the site, which I'm presuming that was maybe Jericho Lake that you were referring to. Um, somebody mentioned there was a, a high lake. Was that Jericho? Well, that's out of our jurisdiction, so I can't comment on that. So, but, but if it's north of Jericho, it's outside the village. Yeah, so I'll set that. Put in for the widening, Pete. Yeah, right. Are you talking the, about the basin at Sitco or what uh, used to be no. Sitco? It's just a, okay. I don't know that's a basin. I think it's just a. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's a detention basin that was installed by uh, King County. So we can't speak to that. So anyway, um, talking about the floodplain here, a couple important points. There's about 60 square miles of drainage above the site. So there's a tremendous amount of area that drains through here. We mentioned that. There's two, two prongs to the floodplain. There's the main stem of Blackberry Creek, and then there's the Montgomery Overflow that actually uh, kind of passes through Jericho Lake, which is a, 
uh, gravel pit that was dug in the 60s. Um, the floodway, any work that's performed in the floodway of, of either of those two branches is governed by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, Office of Water Resources. They will issue permits for that work. Um, the floodplain, uh, which is kind of the fringe of the floodway, that is governed by FEMA and by the county floodplain or uh, county stormwater ordinance, and that's administered by the village. And then the third group that's involved, and maybe you can go to the next one, I forget when we have the wetlands on here. Mm -hmm. uh, this drawing shows that there's additional wetlands in the, in the floodway corridor, so that would be the, you know, the corridor of Blackberry Creek and some of the overflow area. Those wetlands are under the jurisdiction of the uh, Corps of Engineers, so any disturbance to the wetlands has to be mitigated and, and uh, you have to file uh, permits through the Corps of Engineers. So there's going to be a fairly high level of scrutiny on any of the work that's performed on the site. Uh, in addition, any of the development will have to meet all the requirements and the detention requirements required by the county stormwater ordinance, which is a 0, 0.10 release rate, which is pretty stringent. So, and that's something the village had adopted even before the county uh, had uh, passed that ordinance. So. Did you want to speak to um, the bridge going over Blackberry Creek? And, sure. Um, so one of the elements of this plan, you know, that the village has had on their transportation plan was to be able to extend Ockett Road to Griffin and, take, and bring Griffin down to 30 so that we have a bypass around the Orchard Road and US 30 intersection. In order to do that, we need to construct a bridge across um, Blackberry Creek so when that bridge goes in, that'll be permitted through IDNR um, because that'll be in the floodway. Uh, it'll also be the flood plain will be permitted through the village. So that's uh, gonna be additional work that'll be done um, as the site develops. There'll be additional plans submitted for that work. So I've got a question. So by annexing this into the village and being under our stormwater ordinances as this property develops, is it gonna decrease the amount of flooding within the subdivision? So I think the difficulty, it's definitely gonna mitigate anything that is installed in the subdivision. Because there's 60 square miles above it, it's, there's almost, there's nothing really practical that we can do to diminish, significantly diminish flooding. I do think that, um, you know, some of the work, even, you know, the. The gravel mine will have a benefit because it'll be additional storage. Um, you'll have um, everything else accounted for, all the depressional storage will be accounted for. So there won't be any increase in flooding, for sure. Go to the next one. To, to clarify, Pete, when we talked about the, the, the mitigation, like if, so if I'm gonna pave a driveway into a cornfield. That p p pescatory storage so is is the area of the driveway plus some, right? Right. So there's two things going on. When when we have so for anything that gets let's say we rearrange the floodplain. Okay, so we have some flooding in the north, we a floodplain in the north, and we want to consolidate it to another location. When we do that, you have to compensate the, the fill that you put into the north floodplain, you have to compensate times 1.2 times so that there's a, a additional storage that's provided whenever you do any fill. So that'll be something that will be done again by permit. In terms of uh, the impact of stormwater <coughs> rainfall, what you're trying to do is mitigate the impact of the additional impervious area that you add. So the parking lot, the roofs, that sort of thing. So what you do is you store that uh, excess runoff and you meter it out at a slow rate, which would be less than it would naturally have left the site. So there's two, two, area, two things that have to be taken care of, two separate permits issued. Okay, thank you. With, with all this, development that's going to occur, the um, not so much the mining, but when any other manufacturing development, Awkward Road, the um, access egress roads that are gonna come with this development, it's all gonna be based with curbs, gutters, sewers, sewer systems that's gonna come in. 
How does that impact any of this, this flood area? So all of them- Are we adding additional, an additional area for this water to, to drain to? Yes. So all of that will be, as I was trying to ex explain just a minute ago, the f you have two different things going on. You have the comp storage for any floodplain fill that's, that's done to rearrange you know, the floodplain. But when there's um, any roads, buildings, driveways put in, then you put in a stormwater detention basin which stores the runoff from those impervious areas and then meters them out slower and back slowly to the creek. But even beyond that, with these, are, aren't we a storm system, um, gutters, sewer, sewer access, so not only to um, detention areas that we're talking about, but aren't they going to go out into a drain system into the sewer at all, or, yes. or, or are they all gonna go directly to this holding area that we're going to create? And they'll discharge directly to the creek? To the creek. I would think. Yeah, okay. there's gonna be probably multiple detention basins. And when the plant, you know, they'll be likely developing this in units, and every time they bring a unit in, we'll review it to make sure it's compliant with the stormwater ordinance. Can we start asking questions? I don't think they're done yet. And then I'm okay. gonna ask the petitioner for comments first. I mean, you can ask. I think this is the longest this village board has been quiet. So they're, they're actually doing a pretty good job. I'll just mention- um, To keep it together. Because there's some related projects going on in the basin uh, as part of TIF number two. There's some <coughs> regional detention that's going in. Um, and I just wanted to show that it's, you know, it's not directly related to this project, but it's indirectly related, so. We'll, is, we'll leave that, yeah, unless you have questions, we'll yeah, just move on. See, I knew I wanted to talk about TIF 2 tonight. Um, the basins that we're looking at doing down to the southeast, is that providing any comp storage for the any of the Hammond property? It, I couldn't tell based on it, any of the... It, it would be available um, because it's in the same... Anything that would be tributary to that uh, Montgomery Overflow or tributary G, mm -hmm. you could theoretically put in there. Um, but I don't know if we would have enough volume because there's other areas on the east side of Orchard that are contemplated. It's part of that, that tip, but yeah. It's okay. certainly something that can be discussed. Okay. All right, one more. All right, Sonia, did you have? This is just the regulatory floodplain. Um, again, you know, the part of the whole, so I just, it's just another map that has shown what was shown before, so probably no reason to dwell on it. I think next up is um, mining uses. So I don't know if one of the petitioner wants to address mining uses and um, other mines that you've operated in the past um, related to concerns about dust, pollution, permitting, flooding. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening. My name is John Philip Chuck, with offices at 111 East Jefferson Avenue, Naperville, Illinois. And I am the uh, attorney that has been representing the two entities requesting annexation and zoning of, of this property into the village of Montgomery. We've been working with staff for a long time, and many of the issues that were discussed this evening and at the Plan Commission uh, were discussed by us with staff almost two years ago, to be honest with you. And so we're, we're working through these uh, uh, issues, uh, but as you know, until we get an actual user, you can't get down to the hardcore engineering, the final engineering that needs to be done where, where Pete's uh, folks are able to take a look at it and those kind of things. Right now we're trying to establish some broad parameters for uses on the property. And I think you've seen from the comprehensive plan and the uh, TESCA results that uh, we certainly have been working with this plan to achieve the goals of the Montgomery's comprehensive plan. And, and so I think uh, generally speaking that uh, this is uh, very much in compliance with, with the comprehensive plan. Uh, as to the mining issues, the, the Hammond family have been involved with Fox Ridge Stone for over 40 years. They're not novices at mining sand and gravel. They're not novices at mining limestone. Uh, so as a result of the years that we worked with the village of Oswego, very similar to what we're doing with you, we had meetings with Oswego about you know, what, we, what we could put in there, what comes back in there to, to do the reclaiming of the property, uh, there were issues and concerns about the wells because the, we do have private wells on the property, never been affected by the mining operations. There are private wells on properties 
adjacent and across the street uh, from the quarry, never had any issues with any of those private wells. Um, so a, as a result of the landscaping, berming, et cetera, that uh, was done in working with Oswego, I think you can see that they have a track record as to how to address some of those issues. As far as the, the, the dust, uh, there are times of the year when you have to you know, relate to that, and, and when you do, the one thing we have on the site is water, and that's the quickest way to solve the dust problem is to put, put you know, water down on, on any of those areas that, that would involve you know, the dust. Uh, so um, the, uh, we explained at the plant commission level that uh, the uh, uh, crushing of the uh, gravel uh, at, at this time, because we don't know the size of the actual rock that might come out of the ground, we do know that there is a very good deposit there uh, because you can obviously look at Jericho Lake and see that, gee, they did a nice job of digging a beautiful lake there, ultimately, because there were gravel deposits. Well, God gave us the same gravel deposits on some of this property, and that's, that's what we're looking to try to utilize. And as a result of that, we would be able to um, put watering systems on the crushers if we had used the crushers, uh, you know, to, to uh, address any dust issues in that regard. So there are avenues to, to work on, on those kinds of things. You know, sometimes calcium chloride is used. I mean, there are things that are out there that can help with, with, the, with the dust issue. And, and so, again, I, the residential uses are, well, as you can see, they're a considerable uh, distance away from uh, where the mining operations would take place. Uh, it's not like those are right next door to the subdivision. They're, way to the north of, of Ockett Road. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's the parcel three up there, the gray area. And not all of that is capable, really, of being mined, again, as uh, Mr. Wallers pointed out, because of some of those floodway, floodplain issues up there, some of that area is not, not feasible. But the areas that are feasible, we would like the opportunity to take advantage of that natural resource. Uh, so, uh, and again, prevailing winds, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we, we don't see that there's a, a, an immediate impact to any of those residences uh, that are in the county subdivision uh, that are here this evening or at the Planning Commission meeting. So um, we'll design and work with, we've already had meetings with uh, the Kane County Transportation Department uh, to talk uh, with the engineers up there about uh, uh, controlled access on Orchard Road. As you know, there's plans and they have plans for where the access points are and whether they're right in, right out, full access signalize, not signalize, et cetera. So we've, uh, we've had some meetings with them to find out what their thinking was, and so uh, obviously we'll continue uh, as we move forward to work with them. And uh, so what we did is we gave you some conceptual plans that would be in your packet to show kind of the, what it would look like, where the scale would be for, for weighing the trucks coming in and out for, you know, with, with the gravel deposits. Uh, there is a, uh, a plan in there in the event that we were able to get a ready mix concrete uh, facility to locate there. There's a plan there to show basically how that would be set up and, and, and where the, uh, the vehicles would move in and out of that site also. So uh, we've, uh, we've tried to address uh, an operation on this property, uh, which is much smaller than the one obviously over in Oswego at Fox Ridge Stone, but uh, please be assured that the family has a history of operating these kinds of facilities and they can do so in a good neighborly fashion. So we, we feel that while those were you know, proper issues to be brought up and questions to be asked, uh, that uh, we tried to you know, uh, explain uh, what, what we do to address uh, some of those issues and what our experience has actually been uh, when dealing with you know, digging holes, taking gravel out, what does it do to the water levels, what does it do to adjacent wells, those kinds of things. So uh, we are familiar with it, we've dealt with it, and uh, we've had a positive experience in, in dealing with neighbors as to any of those impacts that could happen, but in this case, uh, again, I'd point out they're far removed from where that small mining operation is up at the northern portion of this property. So that's, that's our comments about that mining issue. Sure. Could you okay. address the blasting issue as I'm well? I'm sorry? Could you address the blasting issue as well? Oh, I think you mentioned we, the plant commission. We did commission. mention in, in our hearing that there isn't a potential, and we don't know yet because we haven't uh, 
uh, gone down to see if there would be limestone deposits below the sand and gravel deposits. Uh, sometimes, you know, the, when the glaciers left and they brought all these deposits in, uh, they, they have sand and gravel and they might have some areas of, of, of clay in there and sometimes there's limestone deposits below that yet. And uh, some of the limestone is worth uh, processing and some of it's not, they're not all created equal. So uh, we wouldn't know any quality of limestone if we get to that point, but any mining that would be done with limestone can involve blasting and it's all regulated by the state uh, we're only allowed to do it so often for milliseconds of a time, and uh, monitors are set up, it's all regulated, it's all observed, it's not somebody goes out there and throws a stick of dynamite. It's very, very well regulated. So, and again, we've had experience with that also in the limestone quarrying that was done up in Bolingbrook. Have there been any soil borings done? We have some soil borings, but we have not gone deep enough to determine if there's enough limestone or if, you know, what, what that would be. We've only addressed at this point the sand and gravel operations. And, and there is a, a good deposit similar to what is uh, on the uh, Jericho uh, uh, Park uh, site. Do you know how deep the sand and gravel deposits go currently? Uh, they go down about 30, 40, about 40 feet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you three questions? Um, at the, the Minkler site, the at Fox Ridge? Yes. Is there a ready mix plant there? No. Has, has there ever been? There's never been. Okay. Uh, we've had inquiries about it, but no one has ever actually decided to put one. Okay. There. And then that's sand, gravel, and limestone <coughs> as well? No limestone there. We did, uh, there was an example where we did some, some blasting. Mm -hmm. uh, there was limestone below it, uh, but we determined that there wasn't the quality to make it worth the effort to, to, to actually process it. Mike. Okay. And then have you, and I believe staff has, talked at all with the Fox Valley Park District? We've had some discussions with Fox Valley Park District, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. And then um, after the mining operation is complete, however long that takes, what is the plan for that, to reclaim it? Or I guess what's the use of the property when the mining is done? Well, that we haven't gotten to that point yet. Okay. We, we, we're not there. Figured. Yeah. But okay. we know who our neighbor is, and there's certainly an opportunity there for mm -hmm. you know, maybe some more I've, public I've, area to happen. I've driven past the Minkler site probably every day for the last eight years and do not find that objectionable um, in any way. I know that um, this is a, is, a, is a need of the property owner to, to do this here, which I think otherwise can be accomplished via a special use. If, if you weren't in the village, um, we wouldn't have any any control over that then. So um, I don't find that site objectionable at all down there. I have, I have to be honest, I, my my ignorance to all of this is, I drive past two, I've driven past yeah. two quarries for years that I never knew existed. Yeah. That Minkler site, and there's one in South Elgin, and you wouldn't even know they were there when they berm them. You don't even know, realize that it's there. Um, so yeah, I've been driving past that. I never realized that there was a quarry on the other side of the But I get the, resi the residents' concern is that, you know, mining, who knows what the mining operation is. It's good to have your testimony on that. Um, I, I know staff measured that that mining operation is, you know, plus or minus 1,000 feet from any of the residential homes. Um, so I think all of those things, I think it's just better planning that it's pushed up towards the uh, Jericho Lake, which was a mine itself. My client just reminded me that they've worked for the park district in the past and dug some of those lakes up uh, uh, off of uh, Prairie for the, for the park district. And that large sand and gravel pile that's currently on the property mm -hmm. was mined up there to build those lakes for the uh, Fox Valley Park District. And okay. They stored them down there. So. Do we know the approximate length of time that the mining would occur? And, and I'm not talking daily. I'm talking, is it a next 30 years? Is it or the deposits something where they'll be depleted in 10 years? What, what is it? Two big factors. The amount of, of material that's available and demand. So if our area continues to grow as it, as it has in the past, the demand for that raw material is uh, obviously uh, there. And uh, so that, it's hard to put a, a time on it. So it, it really is market driven by what the demand is for that product. Well, how, 
how long has Fox Bridge been operating? Uh, 40 years. 45 years 40, today. 45 years, so. There you go, it's an anniversary. And we would anticipate that uh, the appearance uh, on Orchard Road would look similar to that on 71 in Minkler with the berming and? That's what we would anticipate would be required by the village in working with them on the final site plans, yes. How and close does the mining on that site to the, is it Paradise Parkway? I think the closest neighboring street to that location. We know the distance between that residence and the mining operations that are occurring at that location. I'm, I'm sorry. It I'm looks like following. Paradise Parkway is to the east of Fox Ridge. I'm asking it just in comparison to the Oswego For site. Your, the Minkler site. He's asking how. What's the distance between? We're 200 feet from the property line. 200. 271 are on Minkler. Well, Minkler. Minkler's even closer. Well. I'm, I'm questioning the sub the houses, the subdivisions, the subdivisions that are to that the Arbor east Gate? of that site. Yeah, you're talking about Arbor Gate? Feet from the well, I'm looking, I'm looking at it. It's Paradise Parkway, Carnation Drive to the east of your location. That's Arbor Gate. That's Arbor Gate, That's Arbor Gate. That's Arbor Gate subdivision, Arbor Gate. yeah. So we're 200 feet from, from the, the nearest lot, and then Paradise is one lot, there's mm -hmm. one lot in. So. Okay. And in comparison, how far north is this to uh, Countryside? Or... Um, oh. I'm sorry, Creekview? To the subdivision, probably 3,000 feet. Okay. So 200 compared to 2,000. Okay. <coughs> All right, did you have any other prepared um, comments tonight? Or? I don't have anything unless you have questions. Okay. Thank you. Does staff have any other? Lastly, do we need to address anything with Wells, Pete, or? I think we've got that all kind of addressed. So I think that's, um, let me just double check my notes really quick. <clears throat> oh, regarding land uses, um, our comprehensive plan, um, I think some of the questions have been why not residential on parcel eight around along Route 30, um, as many of the other developments along Route 30 are. Um, in our comprehensive plan, we identified this area as being commercial and industrial um, and looking at future land uses for it. So again, in keeping with it being near a major interstate, being able to, to provide land for uh, future industrial as well as commercial to serve the residents on the west side of town and taking advantage of proximity to Orchard Road. So um, that is the village's thought process as they went through their comprehensive planning um, in 2013 and 2014 and adopted this plan. So what is being proposed on parcel eight is in accordance with what um, our future land use plan calls for. That's in township now. What's, what's the zoning in township on parcel eight right now, do you know? Or on the entire Hammond property? Um, let's see, so this area here um, is zoned um, F farming. And then this northern area here is all zoned I industrial in the county. Okay. Do they have a comprehensive plan also that you're aware of? And what's their future? If we don't annex this, what are they looking at putting on that property? Do we know that? I believe they do. I don't actually know yeah. what the um, what their comprehensive plan calls for, but I can certainly look into that and get get that information to you. Sorry, if I let you, then I have to let your friend and everybody else to speak one more time. Um, but yes, you should email Sonia. Um, hopefully, you have a bunch of your cards. I'm sorry, I can't. It's, it would be inappropriate for me to let you and not let everybody else. I'm sorry. Uh, but we are not taking action tonight, so you can't submit your comment um, or speak at the next meeting. I have a question about area five. Um, can we go back to that map that shows the areas, please? And, <clears throat> okay, it was, so area five is north of Auckland Road, correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> have there, has there been any um, soil borings there? Do we know what's there yet? We haven't actually done a boring in five. We've done uh, some uh, probing with backhoe. So the depth of the backhoe that we could get in, again, sand and gravel deposits. And that's why we, we said, look, there's probably gonna need to be somewhere on that site 
compensatory storage for development adjacent, uh, probably on four. And so that's why we said, you know, hey, we know there's product here. We'll figure out how to get it over there, but, but yeah, we'd, we'd like to be able to take any of the gravel that comes out of that parcel and take it over and process it in the mining area. So, you know, just to utilize and it. But no, we haven't gone with deep warnings <clears throat> there. I'm gonna express some of my concerns and some of my questions. And to the Hammonds, I, I totally respect the fact that you get to develop the property, that, as the owners of the property, you get to develop it the way that you want. To the rest of the, the residents in that subdivision, the truth is that they can do, with the special use through Kane County, they can do the mining. They don't have to come to the village of Montgomery to do the mining. They're working with us to help develop the rest of the property in order to get that because they want to develop that property and we want, the, we want to develop that property. So we're trying to do something that's mutually beneficial. I was at the plan commission meeting along with uh, two other board members up here. And so we, when you guys were going out in the hall, we were talking to you and kind of explaining and, and correcting misinformation and those sorts of things. And I heard from a lot of residents <clears throat> saying that they didn't want that access road. So after I said, okay, Pete, what happens, is there an opportunity where we can take that access road? Because if I'm not from Montgomery and I'm coming to Stewart, I may think that that road is a, a way out, right? I, I don't know if, if eventually that road goes in and goes to the southeast of parcel, I think six, and up into Ockett or, or what happens. And I asked him, is there any way that we can maybe take that road and go directly north with it, that way people don't see it as a cut through. But, but you guys still have your access, your secondary access if you wanna go north. And so we, we were looking at some floodplain issues there. Um, I'm glad that Pete brought in the, the Route 30 and it shows that it's a full lane, uh, 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 um, I'll not, not just a right turn, right in, right out, of the, whatever that, full access. Full access. Full access. Um, <clears throat> another one of my questions is the village property that is down to the north east, when this, when this annexes into the village, does that property go into this larger property as part of a, is it a, a, any sort of land sharing for, for the road to extend through, for Ockett to come through, or, or how's that working? Next to Parcel so are, are you talking about Griffin? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry. North. Yeah, the annexation South. agreement requires sorry. The, that we extend Griffin to their property line. So we're extending Griffin to that property line. That, that property that you've got your hand on right now, the village-owned property, what happens with that? That, be, that gets developed with the, the larger properties, correct? Per the annexation agreement, um, we have offered them the right of first refusal. So if we do get an offer on that property, um, they do have the option to um, provide us with uh, a contract to purchase so that they can develop it as part of their their parcel, but they're not under any obligation to actually purchase it and develop it as a part of theirs. Okay. And then t talk about the verbiage that's in there for the uh, future well site and the possibility of a land swap. Yes, yeah, so additionally, um, and Engineer Wallers can dive into detail if we really need to go down that road, um, but um, looking at future planning um, and the development of this and maybe some other areas such as the shearing um, property, if we get this additional development in a shorter period of time, there is a high likelihood that we are going to need an additional well to service this area. Um, so we are asking um, for the possibility of getting a well site on this property, and we'd need probably approximately an acre, um, minimum of an acre, I believe, um, for a well site. So we do have the opportunity, if the well is needed and we need to, to get that, that we can enter into potentially a land swap with them for another village property if they, if they give us that property, which could be this property or it could be another one, um, depending. So Got it. looking at that, looking at those options. What's the cost to 
put in a new well? Rodney Roughly. We haven't updated the cost estimates recently, but when we were looking at um, well 16, I think we're budgeting about four and a half million dollars. So close to. Why, why would we, I've been a board member for 10 years, and for 10 years we've had discussions about our depleting wells and we need to go to Lake Michigan water. Why would we spend four and a half million dollars to well, create a well that is going to be essentially obsolete in 10 so years? We, you know, we still have to provide for um, water supply until we connect to Lake Michigan. If we get a high water user that comes into the village, we may need to add an additional well to accommodate that user. Now, if the board doesn't want to accommodate that high water use user, for example, then we probably wouldn't need a well. So it really depends on what develops and when. So we're at least providing the ability to have land available to us to drill a well if we need a well. So we're hoping to avoid drilling wells between now and 2032, <coughs> but you know there's, there's demand on properties in the village and we've had several inquiries on very high water use industries. Um, again, it's, you know, that'll be a, a decision the village board will make, but um, we're trying to provide that it, you know that if we need it, that we have a place to drill it. Did I hear correctly that one of the potential well locations would be the land that's owned by the village at that corner? No. 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 We, okay, I was going to say so it's too would, valuable to. Right. We would. Okay. We would have some okay. sort of a trade. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? I mean, you. I can come back to you. Yeah. I. I, well, I won't cut dur you. During the conversations that we had over the course of multiple years. Um, parcel eight, I never heard the term fulfillment center for parcel eight in, in any of the conversations that I had had. <coughs> I'm, I'm okay with the commercial and retail component. I'm not okay with the, the fulfillment center. Um, if we need a fulfillment center, let's push it up further north. Um, that is really one of my bigger concerns, and I, I understand how uh, the residents in that subdivision are also concerned about it as well. It's, it, I think it's a different, different animal as, as opposed to a fulfillment center compared to commercial or, or some sort of retail business type of thing. Um, would any of the detention basins required for the development of parcel eight, would they be on the east side between that subdivision and whatever is built? Given the grading of the property, um, it would lean towards uh, putting the detention there okay. towards the east side, given the pitch. I have more questions, but go, go ahead. And then, um, John, do you want to comment on, on that, on the uh, fulfillment center on parcel eight, and then also the restriction on the residential use for 10 years, just kind of your position on those? Well, it was the desire of the village uh, to suggest that uh, we hold out and seek commercial users for parcel eight as opposed to residential right out of the box. So uh, we had some inquiries about some residential use on eight, um, but uh, we didn't pursue those inquiries uh, any further because of the uh, request of staff to try to look at uh, development uh, commercially. Uh, good point about where probably you'd have to put your required stormwater management system for parcel eight. And yes, the general slope of the land is to the east, and so it would more than likely be adjacent to the residential subdivision, which gives us an opportunity for more buffering, and then of course landscaping that would go along with the buffering around the uh, detention facility. Um, the fulfillment center, uh, that's, 
That's probably our broker's biggest uh, thing that he said, boy, wouldn't that be great? Thank you, Brian. Uh, but we are a little hesitant to think that we would really get a fulfillment center. Industrial users, yes, we could get some industrial users up in those, in those manufacturing areas, but um, that, that was kind of a pie in the sky. Hey, let's put it in, you never know, maybe somebody would come in and say, you know, this is the most ideal you know, location that, that, that we would like, and we'd see if we could accommodate them. But, but at this point, you know, we don't we don't have anybody, and and uh, but we were willing to put that that criteria in for you know ten years uh, that we wouldn't seek a residential use on eight, and uh, in hopes that that, that you know something uh, could come in that would be a benefit to the village and and the users over at Stewart, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you, but Steve. We talked early on fulfillment because I remember stressing that I didn't agree as well with the fulfillment center so close to to a neighborhood there. But I also said that I wouldn't be in favor of supporting residential development there for two reasons. One, uh, from a, a school, public school system perspective, anytime you add rooftops, you're adding a burden to the school district. So if we can create development that is uh, any other form of tax revenue uh, that's gonna benefit a school district without putting students in the seat, that's gonna be my primary goal. <clears throat> Second, I bought a house within the village which abutted up against an unincorporated area. We picked that street because, wow, this is great. Look at these great huge trees that are all, you know, they've been here for, you know, hundreds of years. This is great, it's an established neighborhood. We closed in October, great day, opened the windows, went to Fox uh, Valley Mall two weeks after we closed on the house. We're at a T intersection, came driving down, and all we saw was smoke billowing through the neighborhoods because, of course, their burn piles were right at the back of our house. Kids with asthma, health issues, the smoke coming in through the windows. I, I lived through it. I talked to Matt early on before I was ever on the board, talked to you guys, went to the health department. Can't do a thing about it, and I said, if I'm ever in this position, I'm never going to let another buyer make the same mistake I did. So I would never support it for that. those two reasons. The resident, any residential that would go here would need to be age restricted, correct? Correct. Um, per the PUD ordinance and the annexation agreement, um, it would could be rezoned for to R5, but only for um, senior or assisted living. Got it. And the the other thing, it kind of goes to, to both of these. Um, any use on this site would need to meet our UDO for you know setbacks to the residential, and set and the the buffering, the landscaping, the fencing all of the things that we need to go. The buffering between residential to residential is much less like you like you encountered, but the buffering mm -hmm. between residential and an industrial or fulfillment center is m much more aggressive buffering um, to, to accommodate that. Correct. Sorry, I could have just asked you that, but I figured it. All right, Teresa, Dan, comments? Yeah, I'm not in favor of fulfillment on parcel eight either. I just don't think it's a good place for it next to a uh, neighborhood like that. Um, did we discuss the uh, private wall issue yet? Any impact on the private walls there? I know that you and I, Pete, had some conversations on depth of walls out there and possibly getting some records and casings and things like that. I'm, I'm reluctant to make a whole lot of comments about that publicly because it is speculation on their wells well conditions and all that, but say what you can. Well, I, I would, that's probably uh, good advice. And we have <laughs> some limited information on the wells out there, but we don't have detailed information. Um, you know, some of the wells that, so the state has a website, the Illinois State Geological Survey has a website. They do publish um, well logs when they have them. Uh, I did go through them, and what you'll find as you go through the um, the wells, and they're not, it's not, it doesn't map all the wells on that subdivision. Um, but there are wells that are uh, range from nominal 60 feet to 140 feet uh, in depth. Uh, the ones that I saw the logs for, you know, are cased through the sand and gravel and open to uh, the formations under, which would be the, the limestone. So, yeah. It, it, you know, we don't have really enough information to make any broad, you know, determinations. Um, 
the um, you know the, the mining activity is regulated by DNR um, also EPA in terms of water quality so you know it's just something I think we'd have to monitor as we go um, I, I don't know yeah I, that's probably about all I can say right now okay. so and you say monitor as we go the, with monitoring wells or well I I I don't think we want to have the village do the EPA's job. I think we need EPA to do what they do and the Department of Public Health. I think those are the agencies that take care of those things. We're not equipped, the village isn't equipped to do the testing, to do the monitoring. It's just not something that we're, you know, set up for. So I think we need to rely on those state agencies and the Department of Public Health to do any of that work. Okay, and that, so that's something they would do then? Okay, thank you. All right, um, <clears throat> I, I definitely support the commercial development along, again, for me the hit linchpin on all of it is that lot eight, parcel eight with the fulfillment center because when it's on the upper 17 acres, it's 60% of the lot, 62% of the lot, 63% of the lot is allowed to become fulfillment and it is quite literally in the backyard of that residential property and I don't know the buffering from that and the buffering from Stewart it's kind of like the chicken coops <laughs> you can have one but you can put it in the middle of your backyard and I, I'm just not sure that it that to me feels like a great fit for this parcel <coughs> I, I think commercial I think some restaurant development there some shopping or something like that would be great and it would thrive with the residential in the area and the Stewart sports complex um, the road I see as a necessary thing um, considering what recently happened on the east side of the street and talking to the chief about folks that couldn't get in and out of their subdivision for quite literally five six hours you can't come home right. you know and if something were to happen catastrophic in front of that intersection and with it now being open in you know full access the thoughts of the complaints that we have about the dangerous intersection at orchard and 30 i see that becoming um another catch point there so again i'm not a big fan of the um fulfillment center on lot parcel eight but the rest of the development <coughs> and the mining doesn't concern me at all I'm, I'm okay fine. Sonia, you, you know the documents probably a little better than me. The, the situation that would allow for a fulfillment center on parcel eight has what triggers? Is it that it's a fulfillment center on seven and eight? Does it have to be on both? I, th there's, I don't think they could just do it no. on eight, if, right? Um, it, does, it does say, um, so they could um, have it just on the northern 17 acres Got it. Um, per per the way it's, that it's written. So it could be on either parcel four, five, six, or the northern portion of eight. Got it. And when you and I had talked about this, when you do the required buffering from the residential, which I don't know how big that is, what is, do you know what that is? Right, so um, any non-residential development adjacent to residential development is required to provide um, <clears throat> a minimum 10 foot buffer that has to have a solid hedgerow as well as an evergreen tree for every 10 feet, ev per every 10 feet. So it requires pretty extensive landscaping. Um, additionally, for, a for outdoor storage, we have a requirement of a minimum of 20 foot setback um, from a property line. So uh, the outdoor storage component does require a slightly larger setback. So that would give you 20 feet of area that would be landscaped um, to, to buffer it from the residential. I'm a definite no on eight. <laughs> 20 feet? That, 20 feet. <laughs> I, I'm yeah. thinking it's going to be 100 feet or. So we had looked, so Sony and I had pulled up um, several fulfillment centers that we, that we could find, Amazon centers, and none of them are 17 acres or less. Yes. Like the likelihood that just a fulfillment center is going to go on that is, it would be, it would be a small fulfillment center. Um, Might as well just take it out. Well, that's not. 
is uh, approximately. as we extend Ockett Road into Griffin, does it make sense to extend Ockett Road into the park district to meet up with uh, whatever the road is that goes through there? And, and have Ockett Road, you have really Ockett Road and the Griffin would be the two major ingress and egress for Stewart. We have talked with the park district about that. So um, the way that the plan show uh, does show the right of way coming up to that west property line. So there is that potential for it to extend into Stewart, um, but that will depend on when the park district is ready or desires to have uh, that secondary uh, or tertiary um, access point into into Stewart Sports Park. Well, at, at some point, because when Stewart came in on 10 years or what was it, 10 years ago? Something like that. A little bit more, yeah. They, we forced them mm -hmm. to keep the right of way mm -hmm. for that road. Are we now at the mercy of the park district to determine when that road goes in? To determine what they do with their well, property? Y yeah, th yeah. They recorded a center line. I think. I don't think that we there's didn't no necessarily need right to give them originally. They have a sign up that says it could extend through there, but there's no, in my opinion. Well, no I'll go over there with a the sharpie tonight instead of could, and it'll say will. Yeah. That's an item we'll have to follow up on. I, mm -hmm. I don't remember how that agreement was left, whether we have the option to construct the road at our cost or not. I just, as I sit here, I don't know that, so I'll have to look at it. I'm not sure the, other than access to their property, I'm not sure what it would benefit to cut it through their property, other than really, really hurting I'm their not property. saying cut through their property. I'm just saying access to that main road yeah. that goes through Stewart. Yeah because that'll help alleviate some of the traffic problems at Griffin and 30 that yeah. they're dealing with, that I'm dealing with, and everyone who lives on the west side is dealing with. Right, and they, they may elect to do that. And I think it would make a stellar entrance, but it's not my property. Okay. Um, anybody else have any comments? Nobody up here? Okay. Do you guys have anything else to add? Yeah, uh, we kind of discussed it among ourselves, and if it be the village board's uh, position that they would prefer to have that language out of the agreement of a fulfillment center on parcel eight, that northerly 17 acres, we don't have a problem with that. Take it out. Okay. Thank you. I feel a lot better with that language. I would. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Any other? lingering objections from the board. So I, I would like staff to finalize these documents for our meeting in two weeks. Anything else that, that you're hung up on? Okay. I just I want to clarify because I was at that planning commission meeting and it definitely sounded like there was gonna be certified letters sent out to all of these folks prior to this meeting. It felt that way to me sitting in that meeting. Am I, did I misread that? Yeah, you, yes. You know, I, I knew there would not be. Well, okay. you, I mean, I, I, mean, I really did think that they were gonna be notified of this prior to, um, but so there will be no notices going out for the meeting in two weeks either. No, That's the only was, certified mailing requirement is for the hearing itself uh, for the zoning, which was that May 4th meeting. Okay. There's no further mailing requirement statutorily or in our code for future meetings after that. Okay. Only for the public hearing. So June 12th is the vote. Mm -hmm. Two, what is it, two weeks from tonight? Ish. Three. Yeah. Three weeks? Three weeks. Three. So the, one, the only other comment that I would make to the, to the residents about the secondary access um, like I said, it really doesn't benefit, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, it doesn't benefit the Hammond property at all to have this connection there. Um, we're planning for that because we've seen two other subdivisions in the area, one in Montgomery on the other side of Orchard Road, and then another one up in, a, um, in Aurora off Orchard Road that don't have great access and are making, in Matt's opinions, terrible turns um, on a daily basis. Um, so what we're trying to do is kind of pick up where government failed on those two projects and at least plan for it. And who knows what's gonna happen. Um, this could be, and I, you know, cover your ears, it could be a long time before any of this stuff develops. I hope that it's not. And when it does, 
we'll look at the connection into that street to see if it makes sense uh, and make a determination at that time. But it's in, there are no plans for development uh, or construction of any of these roads currently. Right. They're working on it. Right now we're, I'd say, at a 10,000 uh, foot level. They're gonna bring it, bring it home with the development um, in piecemeal, like it's planned for in the agreement. So just wanted to state that. And I appreciate you guys coming this evening and sitting through this. Um, but we will have this on for June 12th uh, for action. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, um, so Attorney Julie and I can adjust the documents accordingly. The board's desire would be for the fulfillment center on parcel eight to be removed from the adopting ordinance. Actually, it and sounds like the petitioners, the petitioners are okay with that. that. Okay, yeah. um, so we will take that out of there. Um, it is the board's desire for it to still continue to include the mining use on parcel three and the gas station and everything else that was on there. I didn't hear any okay. any lingering issues. But I wanted to just double check. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Um, thank you. Appreciate it. This will be on for separate action. Uh, Trustee Betzinger is not here, but I believe he uh, will be watching this meeting. So he'll be ready to go for that meeting. Okay. Um, I'm gonna spare all of you, and I'm not going to, to, I don't have to read through all these that are first reading. Okay. So we acted on C. D, E, F, G, H, and I, and J are all first readings that relate to this. Annexation agreement, annexation, rezoning, and the um, plan unit develop the special use. Um, so all of those are kind of related to the zoning action. And then you have the next three after that that are the TIF ordinances um, that adopt the redevelopment plan, establish the area, and then adopt the TIF allocation funding. Okay. Um, so that's the order of that. Perfect. Any comments, questions? Um, I didn't know if we wanted to address any of Chief's concerns that he expressed during the public hearing um, about the TIF. Um, did we need to get into that with this or? Sure. So I know he brought up um, impact fees um, and that is not something that would be addressed as part of the TIF. Um, when it comes to actual monies from the TIF being allocated, it does have to be specifically related to um, equipment that would be needed for the development that is proposed. Um, nothing um, in the development that is proposed at this point is asking for extraordinary zoning relief that would be a taller building or a use that is not something else that would be permitted anywhere else um, in the area. So if they were proposing, say, a multi-story building that was taller than the four stories and they didn't have a piece of equipment that could service a building that was that tall, you know, the TIF could be um, <clears throat> written to address uh, the costs of that particular piece of equipment in order to be able to serve that development. <clears throat> but absent that kind of, um, spe you know, specific need um, for the development, there's not really um, a mechanism within the TIF to allocate money towards um, towards the fire district. So what you're saying is that we can't use TIF funds to talk to to pay for things he was talking about. Correct. Because it's there's nothing extraordinary. Correct. About the project. So what's a long-term solution to that? Because right. it's negligent, in my opinion, to go through and allow development like this without having a fire department that can service that area, whether it's equipment, manpower, right. station. It, yeah, that so station. I, I mean, that. What's the long-term solution to that? So. I mean, the long-term solution is, um, and maybe Mike knows this, the, the TIF plan, the redevelopment plan that we have is like, how many million dollars uh, of improvements that could be funded? I just read that today and it's escaping me. It's, escaping it's me a multi-million well. dollar number. Um, once we achieve that number, the TIF expires. And this is the same conversation that we had with uh, the other fire chief when we did the, the TIF on the other side of the road is that everybody benefits at the end of this project. And the, the big ticket items here are bridge across Blackberry Creek. Um, so the sooner we can get development in there, the sooner everybody benefits from that. And yes, there are growing pains that go along with that. Um, and I, I don't wanna comment on the financial position of the, of the fire district or the size or their budget, um, but Everybody benefits in the end of this, and um, this is not the first TIF. I, I was going to ask you, Chief, how many TIFs do you guys currently serve? Two. Two? 
Okay. Yeah, can you grab a microphone grove? or come up, Chief? Three in Sugar Grove, and one, you said three in Sugar Grove and one in Montgomery. Yeah. Tiff two. So Tiff two crosses so Orchard one, Road. Two. Oh, right. two. So where the gas and wash is. <clears throat> um, that area is in the Sugar Grove Fire Protection District, but is also within Tiff two. Okay, thank you. That's I was. I'm trying to rack my brain as to where this other one is. Yeah. So, so when we did okay. Tiff two, we this would not is not something I'm interested in. We agreed um, to rebate back to all districts the background growth because there was a lot of redevelopment parcels there. Stuff had just gone in. Um, I'm not sure that you really have benefited from that in any way. Um, I understand your concern. Um, and I feel strongly that we're following the letter of the law exactly how we're supposed to here and trying to do its best for everybody. But I understand there are growing pains um, for your district throughout. You mentioned um, the, you said it's 800 calls to Foxmore Fairfield? No, 401 over the last two years, 420 to 2022. And you guys were the lead responder to all of those? Yeah, that's our fire district. You didn't have mutual aid and have- We have mutual aid as, uh, for as an auto aid auto agreement aid? For, for certain types of calls, yes. Okay. Are, do you currently have plans to put a fire district or a fire building down this way? I mean, it's always on the, we have a plan for, for six fire stations throughout my 36 square miles. Which one comes next, I don't know yet. Got it. Com it comes down to the day of the week and, uh, and really the, the hour of the day. Some days we're always up north, some days we're always down south. Right. Because I know we've talked in the past about the need for a facility down this way. Yep. Um, and I think with all the calls that come at Stewart, I don't know who's the first responder to that one, but it's you guys. Typically us. You guys get there before Yeah, we don't else. usually uh, have auto aid to Stewart's. It's, okay. not, it's always on the nature of the call. So, Got it. Okay. Uh, you know, broken legs or arms and mm -hmm. bumps and bruises is not a, a higher call like cardiac arrest or something like that where we have okay. mutual aid coming up. Perfect. All right. So here's a mouse trap to the TIFFs. We'll talk about TIFF too. Is the TIF is gonna go 23 years because there's always more projects than money. I mean, I remember, I wasn't on the board when TIF 2 was established, but I remember the same conversation. And the last conversation we had on TIF 2 is we have more projects than money. We're gonna to have to, sure. to fix those projects. And I foresee the same thing with this. We, we gotta figure out some way to accommodate the fire department through the growing pains. Uh, you know, one of the big things is, as buildings develop out here, um, they're going to be established with an ISO rating and their insurance is going to be affected by the distance to their fire sure. station. And um, I know it's tough in your, your situation because there's not a developer. There's nobody, you know, there's nobody, you know, building. It's not like with Reich Brothers and uh, in the chief with Oswego where he actually had somebody. We knew who it was. He'd go talk to him and, and, and make accommodations. I, I just, I, I just, I don't, I don't, this is why I don't like about TIFFs is this right here. It, it doesn't really affect the school districts, the park districts. It's not, there's not, other than this parcel eight, people aren't going in here to live. So at the end of the day, other than what minor impact it may have on the village, the largest impact is on the fire district and to protect the property out there. The insurance companies realize that and that's why they give that ISO rating. Sure. Um, they're going to pay big money in insurance, right. you know, so somehow if they could redirect some of that so that we could get, and I know that you have mentioned like an impact fee. I know we don't have an impact fee for a fire district. Sure. We do for a school district because there's an impact, right, that they have to build more schools and, and, and equip them, equip them and hire teachers because there's a real impact. Well, in this case, the impact is on the fire district and, and how for 23 years on $800 a year, how is he going to protect this area? And to Sonia's point about the um, the developer having come in and making a four or five story building that would generate meeting a truck down here, 
is no developer. So you're going to put in a TIF district that hand handcuffs me now, 